So in our work, you know that um, our intent has been to try and define behavior in this first uh, uh, few weeks or few months when the spill occurs and the stuff moves into an equilibrium uh, distribution. It will move into this equilibrium distribution depending on these capillary pressure versus saturation curves. That defines how it will be stopped in some place and what the distribution of the uh, phases will be within the column. Uh, that all relates to the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. Those curves say nothing about the rate at which that will occur. And so the rate at which that will occur will be controlled by um, permeability and relative permeability behavior. And so the, the very distinct products that we've talked about so far in this class are first, and we've stacked them on top of each other, are for, and I'm just going to draw them just so you are reminded of these, is the capillary pressure versus saturation curves that look something like these. And on top of these are relative permeability curves. And these are relative permeabilities between 1 and 0, again for the saturations of water from 0 to 1. And depending on how you want to draw these, you can draw them uh, kind of um, as X curves, which is a simplified form, uh, or as the true curves that, that we know they actually look like. They look a little different from that. We know that they look something like this and something like this. And these just allow us to be able to define saturation profiles within the subsurface, which is really what we're looking at here. Uh, where in the equilibrium behavior uh, the stuff will migrate to. And the rates at which it does that are controlled by relative permeability curves. And so it may seem at some times that there's no rhyme or reason in this class. Of course, that, I can't believe you'd ever say that. But the logic of it is that we've talked about this kind of equilibrium behavior first, what the saturation profiles will look like, and in terms of, well, what is it? Um, capital pressure is some function of saturation of water, which is just a, a way of <coughs> writing this curve. And for this, Darcy's law, written in terms of relative permeabilities, is relative permeability times permeability, the viscosity of the fluid, and change in pressure with length. And we've drawn these things before. And so I, I mention this um, because we've described these behaviors in the past. And, and we could go through that again, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure I really want to. I was, I was looking around, usually before I come to class, uh, each time I look at the, the previous year's um, videos, and I noticed that the ones from last year, instead of going to um, uh, YouTube or the course resource page, I'll just look to see where it exists in here, I guess here. And the the movie for this, uh, the raw movie for this class, before it gets uploaded, basically does assignment four. And I, I don't want to go through that blow by blow again uh, because th those resources are already online. And so I realize that assignment four isn't the next one that you're doing and therefore you're not thinking about it yet. But when it comes time to think about it, there's a reasonably comprehensive way, uh, not just that shows you how you might go about that um, example, but shows you uh, the, the calculation technique to kind of codify Darcy's law in your own mind. And so I, I don't plan on going through that again. So, But I just want to refer you to that because it's basically worked out all the way through you and, and you can check through that. But my, my main, so this is for, if you see at the top here, this is for 2017. It's the one, once I upload the, the thing from today, 
it'll be the one that's labeled 2017 for 26, 2 colon 6. And so, and so you can realize how to do that. So, but I, what I will do is I'll mention the fact that the, these two concepts of this equilibrium behavior are really embodied in the next two assignments. So this is assignment number three, and this is assignment number four. So they are basically in, in sequence. Um, I, again, I won't go through them. There's actually, I think for the first three, there's also a video on how to, to deal with it online, as well as um, a worksheet that's included to, to do it. But basically, it's uh, asking you to create, to, to do two things. It's asking you to create a capillary pressure versus saturation curve from laboratory data. That will look something like this. Uh, from 0 to 1. So you, you're going to get these curves from the data that are included in this, this first question. And then you're going to use that to say something about what the distribution of saturations should be within the subsurface. So in other words, use this information that you have here to be able to basically plot. It's going to be something like this curve just placed in space, right? It's going to be this, this curve in some way. So to define in situ what the distribution of saturations should be. So that's the, the first one. So you're working from first principles. I think uh, you probably have enough to go on to be able to do that. These are just the data that you, you'll use for that. And then come up with some profile that will look, and maybe we'll understand a bit more about it from what we talk about today. And then the second one is to basically look at flow rates flowing through a system, and you'll see assignment four is instead of this uh, core plug, cylindrical core plug, you have stuff flowing through this um, square section core plug that has different uh, materials in it. And those materials allow you to calculate what the, the flow rates out of here would be. And I'm sure you can imagine that depending on whether you're flowing out of the pristine material on either side versus the less than pristine material, which is sandwiched in between it, which is, starts off at a saturation of 10%. I don't know if you probably too small to see, right? So the, the saturation there starts off at 10%. So it means that if you're looking at the behavior at 10%, then this is 90% uh, water or 10% napple. And so this, by definition, is the relative permeability to water. And the relative permeability of the napple, the napple's not flowing, right? It's disconnected across the system. And so you'll get a chance to, to kind of put into practice the things that we talked about in class, basically. So I'm, I, all I wanted to do was to kind of put it in context into exactly what we're doing that's parallel to these classes. And you know how to do these calculations. And this, there should be plenty of help uh, online. And the reason putting it online is because it's well, partly because it makes life easier for you, but it also makes life easy for Jihao as well. So there's some method in that madness as well. So look online to uh, last year's presentation to see that. Okay. Okay. All right. So the our principal interest is uh, that we've divided systems, I guess do I have a picture here? Yeah. We've specifically divided systems into these two classes of problems cases where the invading fluid is less dense than the, the water and cases where it's more dense. And fundamentally, we have different behaviors in those in that um, one will be buoyed by the action of the fluid, which won't allow the, sec the invading fluid to pass through it. It may depress it slightly along this boundary because you have a, a height of this fluid above it, which presses down with some pressure. Um, but once it's in place, it will stay there. 
and once it is present then fluid that's flowing past it at some uh, velocity driven by the hydraulic gradient given by the water table will actually carry it downstream and this will be the mechanism by which it ends up at some compliance point in the case of denser than water fluids they behave differently they'll go down and we saw before that they'll go down as deep until we come to some kind of capillary barrier or unless they actually break off part way through and so the, the driving head that's pushing the tip of that ganglion down uh, no longer has enough force to actually overcome the entry pressures. Uh, that can be done by breaking the ganglion in half so that in a homogeneous material it will stall out if it necks down or in a material that where the properties change and this porosity the diameter of this I guess would be smaller than the diameter of this pore diameters by definition and if it's small enough that this height of fluid can't overcome the bubbling pressure the entry pressure in the system then it will pond here and it will exact act as a pool that will get carried dis downstream once it gets dissolved in, in groundwater and so those are the the mechanisms by which we're we're looking at this and so from a pragmatic sense now that we know exactly what the controls on this are capillary pressures defining the equilibrium behavior assignment three and uh, relative permeabilities defining the rates at which it gets transported as in assignment four we're in a place to be able to say something in uh, uh, practicality about the presence of these components in situ and uh, whether they are mobile or not and how we might calculate the uh, saturation profiles with depth and how those saturation profiles might change as a function for instance of uh, fluctuations in the, the water table as it goes up or down and so we'll do it in sequence in talking first about uh, gasoline products and then in terms of uh, dry cleaning products uh, solvents and then in a general sense look at methods by which we might go into the subsurface and say something about sampling exactly what those distributions of, of NAPL are. Um, I won't go through that and I'm just going to rely on, on the figures that we have here and this. And so in everything that we talked about in this class we made the case that we're talking about multiphase flow. And so those phases could be two liquids as in gasoline and water or they could be a uh, liquid and a gas, as in water and um, air in the Vedos zone. And so if we look at these capillary pressure versus saturation curves, then usually the distribution above the water table, we know that by definition, the water table has to have uh, a pressure which is equal to atmospheric, by definition. And if we go above that and look at the pressures changing as a function of height, and I guess in this case we typically use Z as positive downwards, in the same way that we look at um, the gradient below the water table as being a change in uh, elevation and a change in pressure that occurs with it. Because at the water table it's anchored at, at zero pressure, atmospheric pressure, then by definition this capillary fringe is sometimes referred to for obvious reasons as a tension saturated zone. In other words, you can think of it as holding a column of water up that's of some uh, particular height and as you hold this column of water up, the tension that the water must feel because it has a weight dangling off it, just like tension in a spring, string, would be exactly the same change in pressure you'd feel as you go up here. And so it's uh, increasing in pressure as you go below the water table, decreasing in pressure as you go above it, and it's anchored at atmospheric pressure as you go across it. And so these correspond to the different um, components of our saturations as we go up through the um, Vedo zone. We know that in the parts which are 
I do this. If we look at grains joining with grains, then the pendular zone refers to the fact that at these intersections between the two grains, as a, almost as a collar, a donut around it, we have this ring which is um, the pendant, as you like, that's, that's held here. And as we get progressively deeper in the system, then I guess we need more than... Within here, this will be filled with uh, water which will be present on these portions here and a mono layer that's on the face of these. But the white area that's present in here, which would be the air, the non-wetting phase in this particular case, is this bubble that's trapped in here. And so if you apply a pressure gradient across this, in some direction, could be vertically or horizontally, then certainly the water is simply connected across the system and so you'll recover water out of the system but this bubble that's present in this system can only get pulled out if it gets dragged out with the water and it turns out that the forces that are applied versus the by flowing of the water uh, and dragging through the vis viscosity uh, contrast just like a, a, a pebble falling through water it's a drag force that's added on that pebble the water is being moved out of here. The drag force is applied on the bubble to try and drag it out. The forces that are applied on this are relatively small because the water is flowing at a very low rate, and therefore this bubble will exist in here. And so we have this distribution of behaviors within here. We know something about the magnitude of this. Um, we've talked, for instance, about defining um, the height rise that occurs within a, a capillary. And we know that that height rise is something like um, four times interfacial tension um, divided by the diameter of the pores and the unit weight. We could write it in slightly different ways. But if we know that the pore diameters are small, then the height rise of this individual component here uh, will increase proportionally. So you double the uh, half the pore size, you double the height of this uh, capri fringe. And this in this zone, it's basically 100% saturated with water except for residual air. And only once you get beyond this does the, the saturation uh, continue to change. And so surprisingly maybe, uh, if you look at the height rises of these uh, behaviors, then the height rise is larger for more finely graded materials. These are the, the di diameters of the pores, but the diameter of the pores are at least correlated in some way to the diameters of the grain size that make up the system. And so if you look at the capillary rise in gravels, which are quite coarse compared to very fine-grained granular materials like silts, then there's a big difference between them. In fact, two orders of magnitude difference between them because of the changing diameters that are present within these pore sizes. So the starting point in the behavior of this is governed by this distribution, and we know something about this. And we know also that this form of this curve is exactly the same as the capillary pressure versus saturation curves. So now, if we have instead of two phases, which we essentially have here, and the two phases, of course, this is um, saturation of air, and this is the saturation of water. This would be, by definition, our irreducible saturation of water. And this amount here would be our irreducible saturation of the non-wetting SNW0. So these are basically capillary pressure versus saturation curves. So this vertical axis here is capillary pressure. And of course, since we have this, um, we have a relationship that says that the capillary pressure is going to be equal to the height multiplied by, um, well, what is capillary pressure? 
PC is equal to the pressure in the non-wetting fluid minus the pressure in the wetting fluid. The pressure in the non-wetting, uh, in the wetting fluid as we go up from here is just going to be the elevation here. And this is going to be the pressure in the wetting. So this is going to be equal to uh, Z gamma wetting. This is going to be equal to Z uh, multiplied by the unit weight of the non-wetting. And so by definition, this capillary pressure is just going to be equal to the elevation change multiplied by the difference in these two unit weights. Right? And we've kind of seen that before if we zip back to uh, probably a longer than we need to uh, before this, before this even. In a physical sense, uh, no, it's after that. The diagram where we look at going above and below the water table and looking at capillary pressures, where we have two figures side by side. So this difference that we're talking about between these unit weights is exactly this magnitude here, right? The unit weight for the air is basically zero. It's a thousandth of the magnitude of water. Uh, this is negative because it's um, in tension. And so the, the definition of, of capillary pressure divide, defined this way is just this. So these, this is the difference between the green curve and the blue curve are just the difference between those two unit weights multiplied by the same height at which this exists. And so that allows us to be able to say something about scaling. And I guess that'll be assignment three to scale in the subsurface as you go up. So if you know that this is the case, then you could change, for instance, a height, which is z. You could transform that to, uh, if you know what z is and you know what these are, then you can immediately convert this into a capillary pressure with elevation. And so if you do that, then this curve will look exactly like a capillary pressure versus saturation curve. And so um, you have to realize in assignment three that you can do this scaling and that if you use this scaling, we can also uh, use this concept of drawing these capillary pressure versus saturation curves to look in terms of units. Uh, where they will look like this. But you can also write them in terms of this J function, which is a capillary pressure, an interfacial tension, a permeability, and a porosity, which is what we went through uh, the derivation of last time. Right? And we know from what we talked about last time, if you look at the Leverett curves, this should actually be 0.3, which is this value at this bubbling pressure, which we've called PC0, or PB for bubbling. It turned out yesterday, in our, uh, not yesterday, on Thursday, in our calculations, it actually turns out to be 4 over square root 96, if you remember. Um, which is basically 4 over 10.4, a little larger. And this allows us to be able to scale these things. And so the point is, if you end up with a capillary pressure curve defined for one system, and if you know that either the fluids you have are the same and the permeability of your porous medium is different, then you can recreate the capillary pressure curve for that different physical system of different permeability. or if you have the capillary pressure curve defined for one system and you change the fluids in that same material, then if you know what this is, then you can always scale it based on the changing 
characteristics of the fluids, which is interfacial tension. And so <coughs> that's basically the essence of um, assignment three. So if you understand how to put these together, then it can say something about how the saturations of different phases will vary in the subsurface. So right now, we've only talked about behavior for two phases, either water and air in the Vedo zone, or water and d apple below the water table. But what happens now if we add a lighter than water third phase in the system? And so now, these come straight out of um, Fetter, Fetter's book. And this is our original capillary pressure versus saturation curve. This is the water table, this point here. This is the tension saturated zone. It's stated slightly differently. The first class we had, we talked about different ways of defining how much water is present in the system. And so we can define saturation of water as equal to um, the volume of water over the volumes of the pores. That says pores, not very well written. And so that's one way to, to uh, define how much water is in the system. The other way to define it is in terms of uh, water content. And I'm not sure what symbols we use. But moisture content, which is used in these diagrams, is equal to the volume of water divided by the total volume of the sample. So you take a sample. In one case, it has a certain amount of water in the pores. And you divide that volume of water in the pores by the volume of the in the pore space. And so when all the pores are fully filled, it's 100% saturated with water. It's 100% saturated. For moisture content, it's the volume of water relative to the total volume. So when you fill the pores up completely, that would be equal to the volume of the pores. And so the, the uppercase moisture content has to vary between, I guess, between has to be greater than zero, and it has to be less than the porosity, by definition, right? As soon as the porosity is filled, the volume of water divided by the total volume of the sample is the porosity, by definition. And so in this particular case, this represents the porosity of the sample, which is 0.38. It's a bit. And this, by definition, would be what? this. If you go across here, this would be the amount of air that's left in the system. So this would be the irreducible. <coughs> I guess I can't call it the saturation. It's the irreducible, uh, non-wetting moisture content. This would be the irreducible wetting moisture content, right? So in other words, if we look on this, um, this is 0.2, this is 0.1. This is 0 0.02, so moisture content of 0 0.02 is how much moisture is in there as you go up in the column. As you go further down, it's something like 34% uh, of the total volume is filled. And so each, each of these represent those now. So I'm not going to define it in terms of moisture contents anymore, but this would be the saturation of the non, this would be the amount of non-wetting fluid in here, and this would be the amount of water the system. And so it would, it would be saturation if this magnitude here is 1 and this magnitude here is 0 and it scales between those. So I think you get the, the picture you can make. It's just a, they're different scalings. One's relative to the volume of the pore space, one's relative to the volume of the whole sample including the, uh, the quartz that makes up the um, uh, the solid grains. So now, um, after two hours, you introduce uh, oil in the top, and you see a slight change. You have a, a tongue of this oil that comes down here, and this portion is now filled with uh, oil. This portion is filled with air.
and this portion which is slightly less is filled with water and you see if you can compare this amount here to this amount here it's actually shrunk so it's kind of compressed the amount of water at the expense of filling it up with oil and the oil has invaded some of the air filled space so this is the first one this is the second one this is the third one so as this tongue keeps on going down then it has formed this portion which is widening at the base and then ultimately after some uh, amount more than eight hours uh, so it happens quite quickly even though it's a small sample this is um, uh, about two feet right 60.6 of a meter is about two feet in uh, in less than a day it's actually reached some equilibrium uh, distribution so now if you look at the the distributions across this Not that. I'm going to go right through here. Not there either. I'm going to go right through the middle of this. That's good. Then if you look at dividing these individual portions up, then And so this is what the distribution would look like. And of course, if you drew this out in kind of longhand, as we've tended to do for some of these, then physically this would look like a water table. It's exactly what we'd expect it to be, right? So in other words, as we go down through here, we've kind of smeared stuff in this column. This is the smeared zone here. It's a present that may be, in terms of saturation, it's probably 10%, right? Residual saturation is, is left. A smear of 10% is filled with this. Um, there's a portion of water, which is probably a few percent. So maybe this is 3% three, three water. Uh, oil is maybe 10% and the air would be uh, 87% if there were saturations and so this is physically what these uh, chimney diagrams that we've been talking about look like in that you have this chimney that's left here as you go down here you have this ponded region here which has this very high saturation of oil which I suppose I should have maybe done in uh, blue rather than in red, but it's done in red. And so this is this puddle that exists in the subsurface, which is this. And then below that, you have only water existing under here. So if you go down here, it is water. And because the um, the napple is likely water, there's none of it that exists below that. And if you compare it with what it was before, then what it's done is this is, was the upper boundary of the water. And what's happened is it's physically depressed that down to a new location, just by the, the weight of the stuff above it. And so if we look at what these idealized pictures are of what we've dealt with before, they look exactly what we'd, we would expect them to look like. And so you see a couple of things, well, it's just embodied, I guess, in this pic picture here. Perhaps I don't need to, to zoom in on that because we've got it on the same page. Is that we have this, <coughs> pardon me, this distribution that's present here. The other thing that we could do is if we had sensors in here, we could measure what the pressures are as we go down in depth. And so if you look at the figures for pressures within this system, I think arranged slightly differently now. So this is a similar experiment, but now the different stages of this are given. 
from left to right and then downwards from there. So if you went up through the section before, this is where the water table is. And so by definition, this is the place where we have, if you measured the pressures at these different locations, the pressures would be in tension, negative pressures um, above the water table in the capillary fringe, and positive pressures below then. Then you introduce into here some gasoline that will float on water. And as a result of that, the original water table, which was at zero pressure at this point here, uh, gets compressed. And this, instead of being neutral atmospheric pressure, becomes a positive pressure. And as you project these individual pressures up to the surface, you end up with a, a negative pressure at this point. But in the tongue of oil that's going down through here, so in other words, in a physical sense, it looks like this, that this is this tongue of oil that's present down, that's ultimately pressing down on the top of the capillary fringe, that ultimately becomes this. So what would happen if you took pressure measurements in that, would that they would look something like this. And if you extrapolate these to the water to uh, zero pressure, which is this point here, then you get by definition two water tables. One which represents zero pressure of the water here, by definition, which is a water table. And a second one which is zero pressure within the other fluid which is in the system, which is oil. So you end up with a, an oil and water table. If you keep on adding fluid to it, then you end up uh, just by uh, extrapolating these curves, you get these connections between the curves. And the only things that matter to us are where it hits the, um, the zero pressure mark, which are these two points here. And that represents basically a, a water table and an oil table by definition. So you end up with a, a system that's stacked. And in between these, you end up with a pressure which is actually in excess of um, atmospheric because it's driven by the weight of this. And you can't really see it here because these are roughly the, I mean, the difference between the unit weights of these fluids is trivial. Or maybe you can see it from that. But you sh we would know that the magnitude of this um, change in pressure with elevation. Uh, this suggests that because this is, uh, it shouldn't be that way, right? This one looks like it's flatter, and of course a flatter one would be a higher density, and it's not density. So you can't tell from the resolution of this that that's the case. But these would have slightly different slopes to them. Um, I would guess that since this is floating on top of water, then it should be actually steeper, closer to the vertical. Just in the same way that we know that for air, air is almost directly on the vertical because it's a factor of 1,000 less than, than water. And so there are some consequences of this oil table. And so the consequences of this oil table are this. And so in this particular case, it's an aquarium that has pressure transducers in it that's filled with water, and then the water's put on top. Those are the experiments that we've just looked at. Uh, in situ, we don't really have the luxury of having the distribution of pressure transducers to be able to figure out exactly what the capillary pressures are and therefore what the distribution of the saturation is. And so we have to figure it out by some other means. And so a typical means of doing that would be to basically drill a hole down through the place where you think the stuff is sitting. And once you get uh, through that, you look at what the products are that flow back into the, the well, and you use some kind of implement to be able to, to look for them. Um, and the implements that you might use would be, um, yeah, so I guess, well, these are pressure transducers. 
in other words, you drop um, down in the hole, you drop something that has electrical, two electrical conductors on it, joined by a battery. As soon as it hits uh, liquid, it, it completes the circuit and a, um, a light goes on and you know from how much uh, length of this you have down the hole exactly what the, the depth to that particular water air interface is. And you can also get them to sense different electrical conductivities between uh, NAPL and water inf interfaces within the wells. Um, you can also use pressure transducers, just put it at the bottom of the well to measure the height of fluid above you. Or you can put a stick down into the well that has um, uh, smeared uh, compound on it that reacts differently to sensing water versus sensing gasoline products. And so you can use that to measure the different depths of things within a well, but regardless, you can actually measure the, the depth of the free products that's present in a uh, system. But then the question is, if you can go into this well and measure exactly what the, the height of the liquid within this well is, is that really the true depth that's present within the aquifer that you'd like to be able to calculate if you're going to remove it? And I guess the short answer is it's not, and we know that from what we just talked about. And so we can go back to this idea that we have within this um, vertical profile, we have two tables, an oil table and a water table. One lies on top of each other. And if that's the case, that tells us something about the pressures we'd expect to have at those depths. So we know that within this well, by definition, this is going to be atmospheric. And we know that if we go down in this, the pressure at the bottom of this column is going to be the thickness of this column multiplied by the unit weight of oil, which are these two components, right? Rho G. The oil has flowed into the, the borehole. It's separated from all its capillary retaining forces, and it's filled up to a level which is level with the height of the oil in the aquifer, which we would expect to have, if we have enough to do that. So we know that the pressure at the bottom of this column is going to be given by that. But we know that we have a separate water table, which is this one here, and an oil table. Those are the two things that we saw in that previous figure. We know that by definition on this water table, the pressure here also is atmospheric at this point here. And so I guess if we drew a figure that we went down here, then this would be this, starting at zero here. If we started off at this location here, then this would be this at this location here. But this is the unit weight of water. This is the unit weight of oil. And so this would be slightly flatter, I guess, right? Not steeper. And so we can calculate what the fluid pressure is that's acting on the interface between the oil and the water within the borehole. And this height here, W, which is the same as the one that's here, by the way, oops, gives you the pressure of the water that's acting here. So this is this height and this. And so I guess if we equate these pressures, because they're both sitting on top of each other in the well, the salad shaker, right? The water, the vinegar with the oil on top of it. The pressures have to be equivalent here. So these have to be equivalent to each other. If we equate them, then we find out that the, the mismatch between the depth of this um, water table, the height of this water table above the place in the well where we go from oil to water is given by this amount here, just the ratio of the two densities. Also multiplied by gravities, but gravity is the same for both of them. And so what that allows us to calculate is the fact that if we go into the well and we think that the thickness of this is our free product that's sitting in the aquifer, it's not true. The thickness in the aquifer is going to be T minus W. And so if we want to calculate what the distribution in the subsurface is, it's going to be given by T minus W, which is the actual height of this green portion here. This is T minus W.
And so now we're in a decent shape to be able to make a calculation as to how much free product m must exist in there. And so if we draw a little diagram, which is at the bottom here, this is T minus W. This is like our capillary pressure versus saturation curves. Um, the ones that we've looked at, if we remind ourselves, <coughs> these capillary pressure versus saturation curves that we've looked at here, and that is that if we make it simple and we just think of an oil table and a water table, then uh, between the two, this would be the residual saturation of water in this white region here. This would be the amount of oil which is in place within this box here. And I suppose if we wanted to do this properly, So this would be the irreducible saturation of the non-wetting. This would be the irreducible saturation of the wetting, the amount of water that's left in the system. And so if we want to calculate the amount that's uh, in place, then we can do it by looking at um, the amount of volume in the pore space. So the area is if we're looking at perspective view of this. So in other words, if this little uh, vertical section here is something that looks like this, we've done this, on the, you know, this, this picture here, then this here is the area. So this is T minus W. So by definition, the volume of this little red cube here is equal to T minus W, which is the height, multiplied by the area, right? Just the volume of this prism. If we look at the pore space, so this is the volume. What, we, what have we used before? We've used uppercase V, right? Pore volume is equal to the porosity times the volume, which is equal to porosity times T minus W times A, which is this. If we look at the volume of the product, as we called it, of the napple, I guess, is equal to porosity times the volume of the aquifer multiplied by 1 minus the irreducible saturation of the water. In other words, this region here. All the way to the wall. which is this here. And if we look at the re removable volume, of Napple, then it equals this volume of red, but it's minus this part. Actually, I can do something fancy here. It's minus this part here. No, it didn't work. I'll just draw it. So in other words, it's minus this part here. And so this is the irreducible saturation of the non wetting phase. So this is just the same as this. Porosity, the solid volume of the prism of soil, which is this. This is the 
one this is the core core volume I suppose right the square core and it's multiplied by one minus the irreducible saturation of the non wetting of the sorry of the wetting phase which is subtracting this portion off here but if you want to take it out the one part we can't get out is the stuff that's left stuck to the the pore space which would be minus the irreducible saturation of the <coughs> non-wetting phase. So I know I've gone around the corner, but you get the picture. And so these things that we've just I've just written out in longhand are the same that actually exist on this sheet in the first place. Um, the v volume of the pore space is this. Uh, the volume of napple in the pore space is this total magnitude. And the recoverable volume is just this, which differs only from this equation by this extra <coughs> point here. And it's all rational, right? It's just a, it's a volume game that we're playing. And so we can use that. So if you wanted to calculate, for instance, what the distribution, what the amount was that you could recover, then that's exactly how you would go about it. Um, you can see in this that there's some other figures that are some, maybe some slightly more complex ways of why doesn't that come out uh, do I need to do this oh. I guess this would work yeah so if you look at this diagram there's some extra stuff included on it and you see that the underneath this um, there's this um, overarching component and so these actual dash, dashed lines would be the capillary pressure curves that would represent, you know, the true distribution of the saturations in here according to the ideas of this, right? So it's not quite a block that is water table, oil table, everything that's between those is at some given single saturation. It varies in saturations as you go up between them. But if you kind of boil it down to an average saturation that exists here, then you could take these distributions and you can roughly put them up so that this green cross-hatched area is exactly the amount of uh, material that's present within the system. It will be less by this amount because this will be water in here and there will be an extra amount of oil in the system. But this area here and this area here somewhat compensate for each other. And so using this to get the idea of the product um, is, a, is a reasonable estimate. The other thing we could do, but which we won't do in this class, is that you'll remember that these capillary pressure versus saturation curves that we looked at previously, as in this, we can also draw them in terms of what we call Brooks Brooks Corey curves, right? And so Brooks Corey curves, instead of looking like uh, like this, right, which are normal ones that we've drawn today, it takes the log of each of these pressures and it plots them in some way and we get a straight line. And so what you could imagine is that if we had capillary pressure curves for both the water saturating uh, the Vado zone with air and the water being displaced by the liquid gasoline, we'd have two different curves for each of these, something that you'll do in assignment three. If you plotted them in brooks corey space, you'd end up with a capillary pressure curve for the air with the gasoline and the water and the gasoline together, and they'll be slightly different. And so what you could use is you could use these descriptions of these capillary pressure curves to come up with a more sophisticated relationship which allowed you to really look at these true distributions of these kind of interfaces between them. And if you do that, you get a very complicated relationship, um, which is discussed <coughs> in uh, Fetter's book, but which we won't use because it's just not worth our while to do it. To get to first order, to get the, the distribution of saturation, we can always use the expressions that we have on this page. But there are other ways, more complex ways of doing it and more rigorous ways of doing it, but they don't buy you very much. It means that you trade these, this open region here and this closed region here, which roughly cancel for each other. So we won't, won't do that. Um, 
if we did it, we'd end up with a distribution like this. Uh, and this comes also out of Fetter. And again, it looks at these different components. If you look at the part which is um, oil filled in this case, the oil filled portion is this region that goes down to here. And the part that is water saturated <coughs> is this region here. This is kind of the, the, the oil table. And the air region in the top is, is this part here. And so this is what it physically would look like as you go down through that. And that's, that's kind of what we've done. So in other words, I guess what we're saying is that what we haven't accounted for in our quick calculation, we've assumed that this amount here is actually, um, no, we, we've assumed that the oil goes down all the way to, to include this as well. And we've assumed that the part up here is not um, oil. So in other words, we substituted this real oil uh, here for ignoring it, and we've substituted this real water here for oil that we've included in this calculation in this. And so hopefully you can see that this in some respects reflects that, that particular figure. Okay. All right. The other thing uh, that we can do, if we avoid that, is you could imagine that if you have the water table buoying this lens or this puddle of gasoline that sits on the surface, if for some reason the water table goes down, in other words drops, as in this case, what it would do is it would take this region here and merely smear it as it goes down. So in other words, as this physical puddle, subterranean puddle, translates down, then it would give you something like 15% um, you know, saturation, which is smeared uh, in this region. And so physically what that would look like is that it would give you a saturation which would be, um, what would be what? This would be uh, water, I guess in this case, right? And this would be oil. And this would be air. So any way you draw a line across here, you get the relative saturation. But this is the, the tongue of oil that's sitting down here. This is the puddle that's sitting here in relatively large uh, saturation across here. Um, the chimney that goes to the surface exists both in this part here. I guess if you drew a line vertically down here, then you wouldn't, you'd have this would be, this would not be oil above it, right? But it would be only be below it. And then if at some later stage, you get recharged during the summer months. So this is uh, drawn down during the summer, and then in winter time it recharges and it floats back up. Then what it does is it will put residual oil here at maybe 15% in the subsurface. And so now, as you go through this column, this is basically the water table, what we've drawn here. But you now have oil, surprisingly, existing below it. And it's because it's been smeared down as it's gone down here. The puddle's been pushed up again. As a result, it's actually spread out a little further from where it was before. And so it's gone laterally a bit further. But it's also left this smear, which is below the water table, which seems puzzling. But of course, it's just because you have this, this action that's, that's uh, due to the rise and fall of the, the water table. Okay. So we spent probably longer than I wanted to talking about uh, L napples, but what would we expect for, for D napples? And so you could look at the same system where you have a capillary fringe, you enter fluids across this capillary fringe which are denser than water. We know that they'll just keep on going until they hit a capillary barrier. And so if you looked within a borehole, uh, to cut a long story short, the water level in the borehole certainly would say something about where the napple exists within the porous medium. But if you imagine there being a capillary barrier here that would stop the fluid going any further because it's a small pore space, uh, 
then if you had a borehole that actually went below that, there's no reason why fluid shouldn't flow out of the formation and into the borehole. And so long as there's a large enough mass of it in here, it would keep on filling up the borehole up to its equilibrium point. So in the same way that there was a false depth of Napple in the L Napple case that was deeper than we should expect because of this oil table and water table phenomenon. For D Napples, we'd expect the same thing. If you measure the depth of Napple here, this isn't a real depth of Napple because in the aquifer, if this happens to be a capillary barrier, it isn't going to go beyond this, so it'd stop here. And so you have to be careful in uh, making assumptions when you're dealing with this that maybe if your borehole went to the center of the earth and there was enough mass in here to fill up your borehole, it would predict that indeed the height of the Napple was, was as deep as the, as the center of the earth. Um, the same goes for the distribution of dist uh, the components as you go down here. This would be the non-wetting saturation, um, and this would be the, so this, as you look at any point in here, it's just the same as we had before. And of course, if you look at this, um, this shape of this curve here looks exactly like this. Right? And this curve here, relative to the water table, looks exactly like this. So these distributions and the curves they have, they're not just by accident they look that way, but they're a function of the fact that these are capillary pressure versus saturation curves that have worked the fluid into its um, natural equilibrium state. So we made the point. Assignment three, capillary pressure versus saturation, the equilibrium behavior held by capillary forces, says nothing about the rate at which it gets there. If we need to know that, we need to know something about relative permeabilities and Darcy's law, which is uh, assignment four. And finally, I guess, uh, in talking about this, is that in some broad sense, we could also say something about how we would think that these distributions of, in this case, denser than water, uh, non-aqueous phase liquids would look like in the, the subsurface. So if we have the water table uh, that stops here, um, and the gr and ground surface here, then if we had a system that had, I suppose, a high porosity would also mean that this has um, high perm and l low PC0, and this would have a high PC0. So in other words, a silt that has a high capillary rise within it because it's a small pore space, it would be very difficult for us to push um, Napple into it. Um, and so in that particular case, the low porosity would be one where we'd have to have a very high capillary pressure to actually increase the saturation of the invading Napple. So this is oil, and this is water. Right? So we start off with no oil in the system and as the, cap the pressures we apply to push it in it progressively invades more and more of the pore space, progressively smaller and smaller pores in the system. It goes in the big pores first and it invades the smaller pores as we increase the pressure. But because it's a very tight system we can't get very much in it. And the converse of that, a high permeability system that has a low entry pressure uh, all of a sudden is able to saturate at the same, at a much higher level, at a much higher saturation. So this would be the amount of oil in the system, and this would be the amount of water in the system. And so it, there's no surprise that these saturation versus depth curves look the same, because capillary pressure 
is a function of depth for the, because of the reasons we've talked about today. Okay, so so hopefully that's put this in perspective. Um, uh, I'll let you. Yeah, I won't go through the remainder. I think there's. Um, so the the next three topics uh, which are online. So we've made the case that these capillary pressure curves exist for two phases. Primarily, we're interested in how gasoline and dense non-aqueous phase liquids move in the subsurface. But of course, to get into the groundwater region, they have to go across the Vado zone, the unsaturated zone. So we'll talk a little bit about capillary pressure and relative permeability relationships for unsaturated flow, which is 2.7. And then um, the next part of what we'll talk about in the class is that once we know what this distribution looks like in the subsurface, we'd be interested to know in how quickly it gets carried downstream and how quickly it gets to a compliance point and in what concentration it might end up in the compliance point. How soon it might arrive and what concentration. So part three, I guess, of this class is looking at advection dispersion equations which govern how dissolved components of this are carried downstream and will then arrive at some location where they might do some harm and how we can calculate when they arrive and in what concentrations they arrive. Okay, thanks very much.